Hi everybody, this is Nico from QTools and I'm glad I can welcome you to today's webinar in cooperation with Quantum Design where I'm going to give you an overview about our quantum education tools and especially the QED and all its add-ons but I'm also going to talk a little bit about the Quantum Coffer and our NV Center Experiment Kit, the QNV. So as an introduction, let me just tell you a little bit about our company, QTools GmbH. Um, we are a small company situated in southern Germany in Munich and we're sitting in this uh, nice looking building over here. And um, since 2005, we are sharing our fascination for quantum physics with all of you guys. And uh, we began by designing the QED, which is actually our very first product. And um, it was designed to teach, to help you teach um, quantum physics to your students. And in that same thought, we developed the quantum coffer and then also the QNV and V center kit. Um, also in our portfolio are some precision measurement tools like the QTAG time tagging device, but also um, we have a distance measurement device, the QDIS, which is based on interferometric distance measurement. So as I said before, the main topic of this talk is going to be the QED, the quantum entanglement demonstrator that you can see here, which is an experimental kit with which you can perform many experiments for quantum physics. Um, basically, I'm going to introduce to you the, the heart of the, of the QED, which sits in this small white box over on the right side, um, where the photon source is situated. Then I'm going to talk about the optical breadboard and what you can do with that. And um, also what we have inside this big electronic box over here. And then I'm going to come to the add-ons um, that will enlarge the portfolio of, of experiments you can perform with this experimental kit. So the entanglement demonstrator is the first real product of QTools. We have it since 2007. And of course, in the beginning, it didn't look like this. Um, it changed a lot since then. Since, of course, in the beginning, we only had one guy who could um, work out how to build up the source and how to align everything. And um, he took about two weeks for one of these setups. And still, in the end, he had to, um, he had to hope that everything would work out fine. So, of course, we streamlined the process. We um, made some huge improvements on the alignment procedure so that now uh, pretty much everyone can do that. So concerning the application, basically we have the photon source that produces um, entangled single photon pairs. And um, with those single photon pairs, you can then do a lot of different pre-arranged experiments that we describe in the manual and also some of them on our homepage. Just have a look if you like. Um, the whole thing is designed to be in a lab kind of style, so nothing fancy here. Um, concerning the options, basically you can choose um, to upgrade from a low-rate version to a high-rate version. Um, we specify uh, at least 3000 coincidences in every basis for the high-rate version. So I would definitely recommend that to you since it simplifies the alignment procedure. And also, if you're going to use add-ons, it really makes your life a whole lot simpler, basically, just because you have a higher signal and um, you're not dependent on getting every single photon pair into the detectors in the end. So get the high rate. And also um, you can choose between a manual version that you can see here. And also we have a motorized version where these two polarizers that you can see in the beam paths are motorized. So you could um, uh, perform the experiment automatically or um, also do it remotely, which is, which I also will talk a little bit more about on the next few slides. Um, we have at the moment, we have four add-ons, the HOM, Hong Wu Mandel setup, the HPT, Henbury Brown Twist, the Michelson interferometer, and also an add-on for performing quantum key distribution. For the technical description, I'm going to talk a little bit about the, what's on the optical part on this side, and especially what's in the small white box over here, which is the photon source. And also I'm going to speak about the control unit and what's included into this and how the two units um, are connected to each other. So at first I'll describe the source to you. And uh, for that um, I'll go I'm going to show you an animation that we have on our web page. Um, I'll give you the link later. And basically what you can see here that we have a uh, laser uh, at the one side. It's a high power uh, pump laser at 405 nanometers. And, um, here, for simplicity, we have uh, it emitting only one photon. And this photon is going to be hitting a BBO crystal, which is a nonlinear crystal. 
And in this crystal, um, this uh, pump laser photon is going to be down converted with a certain probability into two photons um, with double the wavelength, so half the energy. And um, then these two photons are coupled into optical fibers and led to a detection unit with uh, single photon detectors. We use APDs and also a coincidence logic to determine if uh, two single events are actually uh, from the same event in the BBO crystal. Um, so with this you already have coincidences, but it's of course not enough to produce entanglement um, since we only have horizontally polarized pairs in the end. So um, what you'd like to do is to put another BBO into the beam path and um, this BBO's uh, optical axis is um, rotated by 90 degrees with respect to this one, which means you also need a differently polarized pump light. So what you also have to do is put in a half wave plate into the beam path that changes the polarization state of the um, pump light, which leads to, to a process in this crystal or in this crystal. Um, of course, these are not two photon pairs, but only one photon pair, but um, we don't know if it comes from this crystal or in this crystal. Um, but as you can see, those are happening at different times and also they have a little bit different shape. Um, so you have to introduce these pre and post compensation crystals, put them into the beam path as well. We call them IVO crystals. And um, if you do that, you can see that in the end, when uh, the photons are coupled into the fibers, um, you cannot distinguish anymore between uh, photons coming from the first crystal or from the second crystal, which means that you have to coherently add up the different terms for that. And um, that leads you to the entangled state phi plus in the end, as you can see here. So here you can again see a small schematic of the process. And um, as I said before, uh, this process is happening with a probability of only 10 to the minus 11. So only a very, very few, very, very small amount of these um, pump photons are actually being transformed into down converted photons, which is the reason that we need such a high power pump laser with just a lot of photons in them. So we get a reasonable uh, number of, of photon pairs out in the end. And uh, down here you can also see the um, link to the animation that I just showed you. So how does it look in real life? Uh, here you can see uh, a view under the white hood of the optical part. So in, under this white hood is uh, this optical setup where here's the laser. Um, we have one lens uh, right in the end of this casing over here. Then we have another uh, lens um, just for beam shaping um, reasons. We have two mirrors with which we can uh, align the, the laser to hit the BBO crystal, which sits over here at exactly the right spot and under the right angle. And then um, we have an alignment target. There's a very small pinhole in the middle and there's also markings on the front side here for a uh, simple alignment procedure. And um, then we have uh, these pre and post compensation crystals also glued in there, but uh, the wave plate that we can put in the front here. At the moment it's in the parking position, but you can also put it into the beam path. Um, that's the only thing that you can change in the source basically, since uh, everything else, um, we don't want you to um, have to hassle with, with all that, since it's gonna be real difficult to get alignment back if you, if you change anything here. So that's the reason why we glue everything in place. And um, just the wave plate you can put out or put in to get an entangled state, phi plus, or uh, the product state um, of two horizontally polarized photons. And you could also put it in backwards, uh, which would get you the phi minus entangled state, which is just another of the Bell states. So we put all that under this white box because of laser safety reasons. Um, basically, when with, without the white box, you'd have a class 3B laser um, at the UV light. So you'd need eye protection and a lot of other safety precautions for that, um, which is why we put it under the white box, which has a long pass filter at the end. So the pump beam is going to be blocked and um, the two down converted photon beams uh, are not of any uh, concern since those are at a non-measurable intensity. So you wouldn't, even, you wouldn't even be able to measure them because it's in the, in the single photon level, of course. Um, we have this small lid over here, so you can remove this small lid to get access to the wave plate. 
So you could put that in a different position without having to remove the, the, the whole white box every time. So here in red you can see the, the um, emission cones of the down converted photons. Um, those are hitting uh, first a mirror and are then um, coupled into single mode fibers at a fiber coupler. And um, in the beam path there is um, here you have three slots to put in polarizers or other optical equipment and on the other path you have two slots to put in some equipment. Um, also right here you can see a slot for an alignment plate um, which is going to be used for a very simple alignment. You'll just have to make sure that um, a beam coming from the detection side hits the right spot at this alignment plate and also on the alignment target I told you about before. And if you do that you are already going to have some signal that you can, can optimize using um, the screws on the mirror and on the coupler and in the end you're gonna have a very good entanglement between these two, uh, the two photons in the fibers. These, uh, these single mode fibers are polarization maintaining um, which means of course they are only polarization maintaining for horizontally polarized light or for vertical polarized light but of course they won't conserve the entanglement. So if you um, want to make an experiment concerning the entanglement of the photons, you need to do that before the, the fibers. Um, all the add-ons only use uh, the, uh, the, the non-entangled photon pairs. Um, so you have to remove the wave plate. So you are producing only horizontally polarized photon pairs and those horizontally polarized photon pairs are preserved through the polarization maintaining fibers so they will arrive at your add-ons um, in this same um, configuration. Also in front of the fiber coupler we have this long pass filter um, which filters out any light that um, would come in from some ambient light sources and is not the actual down converted light. Of course if you're going to put the setup in direct sunlight or in a room that is flooded by direct sunlight um, there's also going to be some 810 nanometer uh, photons in the sunlight but if you're in a, in a room with some um, LED light or something like that um, most of the light is going to be blocked. So you can easily make all the experiments directly in a, in a highly lit room, that's no problem. So what we talked about till now is all the optical part that sits over here and um, now I'm going to talk about the QCR, the control and readout unit that contains all the electronics. Um, for starters, of course, the laser has to be controlled. So we have a laser driver into, in the QCR that is connected via a cable to the small white box over here. And then, of course, we need to register the um, detection events in uh, two to four APDs, um, which are also included in the control and readout unit. And uh, these APD signals are then um, relayed to an FPGA which contains the coincidence logic and also communicates with a Raspberry computer um, on which the user interface is programmed. So on this Raspberry you have the user interface, the touch display and everything. And then in um, dashed lines you have everything optional. So for example you could um, put some add-on, some optical part of an add-on between the fiber couplers over here and the APDs that detect the signals and if that's motorized you're gonna have a motor driver that is connected via USB to the control unit and that controls the motors that sit on the optical part and um, also if you're having the, the quantum key distribution upgrade you're gonna have a pulsed source that which is an upgrade to the QCR it's just gonna sit between the laser driver and the actual laser and it can um, pulse the laser source as well. Uh, then maybe an interesting thing is that um, you have a network connection at the back so you can communicate with this Raspberry computer via the VNC protocol and just uh, copy the display maybe for uh, presentation reasons. So if you want to have the, the QCR screen on the Beamer that's no problem. And also you have a very small HTTP protocol accessible via network um, with which you could uh, program your own programs. And of course you could also connect a USB stick um, to collect the measurement data and analyze that further at a, at a later step in a computer or something like that. And because of the ongoing current situation we have with the global corona pandemic, um, I want to go a little bit more into detail on the remote capabilities of the QAD. 
Um, basically, we have this uh, VNC protocol, as I just told you, with which you can completely control the whole graphical user interface of the QCR unit. And basically, you can do everything um, that you can do on the GUI, you can also do at home um, if you just have a network connection to the lab. And also, um, you have this HTTP protocol for your own programming, and um, you can control everything that's motorized. So also the the, the motorized uh, QAD basic, of course, but also every add-on that is motorized can be controlled via the uh, remote interface. Of course, what you cannot do is the alignment. You have this manual screws for that, and also um, someone situated at the site has to manually switch on the laser, uh, just for laser safety reasons. And also, if you would like to change add-ons or change the position of the wave plate, of course, you need something on somebody on site. Uh, but everything else can be controlled remotely as well. Um, I have also a YouTube video on that, so just check out our YouTube channel. So what experiments can be done with the basic setup without the add-ons? Um, basically, you can do everything that concerns the polarization of photons and also the polarization entanglement of photons. Uh, you can see here a small list of uh, basic experiments you can do, and the bold ones we describe in the manual. So uh, those are the, the most interesting ones, I would say. Basically, you can uh, do the Bell experiment, where, we, uh, where you measure a CHSH type inequality. Um, you can um, prepare and measure different Bell states and discriminate between them. And you can measure the correlation curves for these different maximally entangled two-photon states. And of course, this is not a complete list. I mean, you can always think of some experiments you can, you can do additionally with that. Or um, if you get some additional components like water wave plates, you can also do tomography and stuff like that. Let's now talk about the add-ons we have that expand the suit of experiments that you can do. Um, basically, we have at the moment four complete add-ons. Um, the first one being the HOM, Hong U Mandel setup. Um, then we have an HBT add-on, a Michelson interferometer, and also an add-on for quantum key distribution where you can uh, perform the BB84 protocol. So let's start with the HOM Hong U Mandel setup add-on. Um, basically, it consists of uh, another optical breadboard um, where you have two free space lines, one of them variable by this um, translation stage, one of them fixed. And on one side, this on the right side, you have the, the, the input couplers um, that are connected to the output from the QAD. Um, so the photons come in here, they'll go over to the other side, be coupled into the fibers again, and uh, the fibers lead to uh, uh, a polariz po polarization-maintaining beam splitter over here. And um, afterwards, the outputs of these beam splitters are then um, directly going to the QCR detectors. You can get the Hongu Mandel setup um, with a manual translation stage, but also with a, with a motorized one. Um, basically, for this, I would really recommend you to get the motorized version, since it's just so much more fun to work with than, than, the, than the manual one. I would also not recommend using this add-on um, with a low-rate QAD, um, since it's just so much simpler to see the, the physics behind all this if you have a high count rate of photons, and it's very easy to, to couple everything, to align everything if you have this high-rate version, but it's more difficult if you have the low-rate version. This add-on has to be matched to the corresponding QAD, um, since it's very important to have the same path length for the two photons uh, from the BBO crystal right up to this polarization-maintaining beam splitter over here on the add-on. Um, so basically, we do that for you at QTools. Um, we arrange everything such that um, the, fiber, the fibers from the QAD to the uh, HOM setup are of the same length and um, also we put a small marker over here where you can see the spot uh, of the variable translation stage where we observe the Hongo Mandel interference. So what is this interference? Um, basically when two indistinguishable photons impinge on a beam splitter at exactly the same time um, then they interfere in a way that they always leave the beam splitter at the same output port. Isn't that romantic? Um, so basically what we observe is the coincidences in the two output fibers of the beam splitter and then we, um, uh, we change the path length of this variable free space line 
such that we um, go over the point where the path lengths are exactly of the same length. Um, and what we see actually is that we get a drop in the coincidence count rate, um, just because we don't have uh, the, two, the two photons in different output ports anymore, which would lead to a coincidence, um, since they leave always in the same output port. Um, in combination with other add-ons, um, it's especially nice to put uh, HBT setup, which is basically another beam splitter, behind uh, the Hongo Mandel setup, so in one of the output ports, where you can actually observe that the number of two photon events in one of the output ports rises at the uh, corresponding spot over here. So let's continue with the uh, QAD HBT, the Hanbury Brown twist experiment, where we basically have a fiber based uh, beam splitter over here and also an additional um, single photon detector module that you can insert into the control unit. Um, with this setup, you can um, measure the, the G2 function, so you can see that you actually have um, single heralded photons in there, and you can observe the particle nature of photons with this, and also um, generate some quantum random numbers, um, just by observing um, which output port of the, of the beam splitter is chosen by your uh, impinging photon. Um, in combination with other add-ons, uh, this is a very nice add-on. Uh, we already talked about the photon statistics with the Hongo Mandel setup, but also um, you can really nicely show the wave-particle dualism when you employ the HPT setup behind an interferometer like the QED MI Michelson interferometer, which you can see here. So this is the Michelson interferometer. Basically, um, we have an input fiber over here. Um, the photons hit a beam splitter right in the middle over there and they can uh, go either path A or path B, are reflected back to the beam splitter and then um, go to the output part where they are coupled into a fiber again which can lead to the detection unit. The Michelson interferometer was developed um, with path length as short as possible just because uh, short path length corresponds to the interferometer stability in a good way. In order to observe interference you need to uh, change the path length in at least one path and for that we employ this movable glass wedge. Um, so um, depending on how thick the glass is the optical path length of path B is changed either by a motor as you can see here or of course you can also get a manual version. An added feature of our Michelson interferometer is that you can insert um, polarizers into path A and path B and also put one into the output port behind the beam splitter, which means that you can first destroy the interference by putting some which way information into path A and path B, and then you can regain the interference by erasing that information with a 45 degree polarizer in the output, even behind the beam splitter. This is called a quantum eraser experiment. As for the other experiments you can do, um, here's a, an example measurement of the interference of single photons in the Michelson interferometer. Um, of course, we used the motorized version for this. Um, you can also use this as a single photon spectrometer, since uh, when you put a fit onto this, you can determine the wavelength and the coherence length of your single photons. Um, you can do the quantum eraser experiment, and also you can do some interaction-free measurement, which is sometimes also called the BOM test. In combination with other add-ons, we already spoke about the wave-particle dualism, but um, some very interesting experiment is also the Franzen interference, uh, where you would need another Michelson interferometer, um, where you can show that uh, in the coincidences you can observe interference at a spot where it would not be uh, possible in the classical world. The last but not least of our QAD add-ons is the QAD QKD, our quantum key distribution add-on, which is basically an upgrade to the QCR control unit. Um, I already showed you that uh, we can insert this pulsed laser option between the laser driver and the laser, such that we can pulse um, our pump laser, which of course leads to weak coherent pulses um, of single photons in the end. And those can be used for a real quantum key distribution experiment like maybe the BB84 protocol. In addition, you'll get a wave plate so that uh, Alice can rotate her polarization state and you can use one of the polarizers uh, for Bob's polarization analysis setup. We have a pulse duration uh, that you can set between 1 microsecond and 100 microseconds, and you can um, turn the frequency up to about 1000 Hz, so 1000 pulses per second, or you can also do single shots by the press of a button. Here you can see the user interface for the BB84 protocol, 
uh, where you can generate random numbers for Alice's and Bob's uh, basis and bit value choice. And then you can automatically run the uh, BB84 protocol, first the uh, quantum channel, uh, which is employed using the single photon recoherent pulses. Here in the middle you have some buttons to perform uh, the classical part, the classical communication part of the protocol. Also with this pulsed laser options you have a lot of other experiments that improve didactically just because you are able to produce a weak coherent pulse with an average photon number of uh, under one photon per pulse by the press of a button. So for example the projection or ensemble measurements, the particle nature of photons, the random number generation, all that improved didactically by using weak coherent pulses of course. So to conclude our overview over the QAD and all its add-ons, here on this slide we have chosen 14 of the most interesting day-filling experiments um, that you can do with the QAD and its add-ons. Um, you can see here what you need for each experiment. And uh, we designed some uh, sample lab course with all those experiments, where if you have two QADs and two Michelson interferometers and one of each other add-on, um, you can have two groups working in parallel on different contents each day, for 12 days in total. And also here you have uh, three experimental groups working on three different QADs at the same time and you wouldn't uh, need uh, any more of the add-ons for that. So after this detailed explanation of the QAD and all its add-ons, let me just briefly introduce the quantum coffer, which is our quantum physics in a suitcase experimental kit. Despite the very obvious optical differences, the quantum coffer is essentially uh, also a system that employs spontaneous parametric down conversion to create entangled photon pairs um, with which you can then perform some experiments. Um, actually, it has basically the same source as in the QAD, but um, in this case, as you can see on the right side, it looks a lot more complicated than uh, the source we, we, we have seen before for the QAD. And that's mainly because of one reason, namely that we have it fully motorized. So everything from the half-wave plate to the IVOs and the BBO crystal can be moved by motors. And uh, also you can couple into the fibers via two mirrors um, that can also be fully controlled by motors. We have also worked very hard to um, get the greatest usability and um, we have built in some automation like 2D scans that simplify the alignment procedure. Also down below in the quantum coffer, we have three single photon detectors, three APDs, um, that can also be switched into a continuous mode where you can actually detect uh, bright light as well. So you could also perform experiment with a visible laser. And uh, also we have a time tagger built in there uh, with a very high timing resolution so you can actually do some more experiments. For the actual experiments, the so-called Q-bricks are used, that you can see on top here. Um, for example, a simple optical element is in one of these uh, modules. Here is a mirror, a glass wedge, a polarizer, or a 90 degree mirror. And um, with those, you can um, just stick them into the, into the playground board anywhere you want, and in any direction you want, and you can build up your own experiments like that. Maybe a word on the usability. Um, all of the cube bricks have a touch detection in the lid on top. So if you're touching them with your, with your hand, you're going to get uh, some small uh, view on the touch screen over on the right side, uh, where you can actually control everything the cube brick does. So for example, here um, we, we touched a glass wedge cube brick, and on the right side we can now control the motion of the wedge and set it to some specific path length. But of course, with the modular nature of, this, um, of these experiment build-ups, um, you're going to have some losses on the, on the stability of, for example, a Michelson interferometer that you can see down below here. Also, of course, all these fancy features uh, cost a lot of money, so the quantum cover will be more expensive than the QAD. So basically, I would recommend to you to get the QAD when you want to uh, have a stable lab course um, with a lot of different experiments. Um, all of those you can do with the QAD and its add-ons, but if you want to have a little bit more of a playground feel, if you want to fascinate more, if you want to have uh, some more cognitive activation just by the beautiful engineering of the product, um, then you should uh, probably think about the quantum coffer. That concludes the short introduction on the quantum coffer, so let's now talk about the QNV 
our experiment suit where you can do your own experiments um, with the nitrogen vacancy centers in diamond. So in the lattice structure of a diamond, there can be error sites. And one of these possible error sites is that there's a nitrogen atom instead of a carbon atom at one side, and um, there's an empty space at the next lattice site. That's why it's, why it's called a nitrogen vacancy center. And this nitrogen vacancy center behaves as if it were an atom itself, even at uh, room temperature, which is the big advantage of using nitrogen vacancy centers in diamond. Here on the left side, you can see the energy schematic of such a nitrogen vacancy center. And um, what we're doing with the, with the setup is that we use a green laser to excite the nitrogen vacancy center into an excited state over here. And what happens then it, that is that it spontaneously decays back into the ground state and emits some kind of red light. Now that's what we call the nitrogen vacancy center fluorescence. What you can also do is to use a microwave frequency emitter to drive a level change over here where the atom goes into an intermediate state that um, has some longer lifetime, which will not decay as fast, which will be dark because it doesn't emit the red light. So if you're driving the excitation of the atom with a special frequency that fits the energy level discrepancy between these two levels, um, you're going to see a drop in intensity. So over here you can see that this happens at a specific microwave frequency. What you can then do is to apply some external magnetic field B, which will lead to a Siemens splitting of this energy uh, level into an MS plus one and an MS minus one state, which are both dark. But of course they have different energy levels, so we're going to see a dark spot at different microwave frequencies, which you can see on the right side here. And just by the uh, distance between these two dark spots, uh, you can calculate the B field that uh, was responsible for this energy splitting. You can use this effect to precisely measure magnetic fields at a very specific location in space. So, for example, if you put a very, very small uh, diamond with a single nitrogen vacancy center on top of an atomic force microscope, for example, you can then measure the magnetic field at the position of your uh, microscope level. So here's our experimental setup. Let's see what we can do with it. Uh, basically, on the left side, we have a laser diode that emits the green light and which is focused onto the sample holder over here where we have a small diamond with a lot of NB centers. So uh, it's important to note that we're not uh, doing experiments with a microscope on a single nitrogen vacancy center in a diamond, but we're using a whole ensemble of nitrogen vacancy centers in the diamond to uh, observe a lot of these effects. Also on the sample holder, we have a microwave antenna uh, with which we can uh, drive the microwave and uh, activate the, the transitions in the microwave spectrum. And then behind that we have uh, some filter and then a photodiode um, that measures the intensity of the fluorescent light from the nitrogen vacancy center and uh, transmits it back into the control unit. The control unit itself just looks like uh, the control unit of the QAD and uh, has uh, some similar software where you, where you can control the laser current, um, read out the photodiode, control the microwave frequency and do all the experiments uh, in the graphical user interface over here. And just like the QAD, it has the remote capability for the VNC uh, protocol. So with this setup, you can observe the uh, nitrogen vacancy center fluorescence. You can actually observe the Z-man effect. You can do optically detected magnetic resonance, ODMR, and also some magnetic field sensing. And with that, we've already come to the end of the webinar. And let me just tell you that if you want to know more about our products, you can always have a look at our website. Uh, where we have a lot of the manuals online and where we describe uh, shortly a lot of the experiments you can do with the uh, educational tools. And, uh, but we also have a YouTube channel where you can actually uh, look at me doing some experiments or explaining about our products. So let me thank you again for participating in this webinar.